Yeah, so I want to give an example of how plant material contributes back to soil. In this case, this is gravel, pure gravel. But I'm going to pull this guy out, hopefully. If you look closely, it's slowly turning the gravel into a really rich soil. Okay, so we do this crazy little trick that I want everyone to sort of understand and it works. These, these uh, fruit trees, we want them to grow a lot faster than they normally do so we're exaggerating that growth. So what we do is we always plant lower growing plants directly in competition with these fruit trees and what happens is we get I would say 10 centimeters more growth every month or five centimeters. We get more growth when we put these guys under stress and competition. There's so much new growth on this um, that it makes such a difference that we're forcing this fruit tree to compete with these plants. So my suspicion is these ornamental plants are feeding this plant because they're interested in supporting this plant to get shade. These these plants most likely are interested in being shaded because it's less stress on them. So by this competition happening here, this tree will grow much faster. This fig tree will reach for the sun. It'll separate itself from these other plants. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough. I've really learned a really valuable lesson that plant diversity has an incredible impact on soil diversity. By having these different plants all growing in close proximity, they are also contributing to a very different um, energy in the soil. The soil makeup, the microbes, or whatever else you want to say that's in the soil, is very different when you have um, polyculture, not monoculture, where you have one plant. This idea of having all this life, and we're going to exaggerate this even more. We're going to add more and more different plants to this garden. And the benefit of that diversity is insane. It is, I don't know, it's so powerful in terms of keeping your soil battery working. So always consider um, plant diversity as one of your, one of your secret weapons towards um, perpetual soils or very strong soils. This idea of diversity, plant diversity, is such a strong tool in your toolkit in your garden. Yeah, when you're talking um, soil preparation, we do a, a, a really crazy job on uh, fruit trees. We'll dig a really big hole. We'll make sure that there's no heavy duty rocks below, that the roots can go wherever they need to go. And these fruit trees, they appreciate that. They do incredibly well. You know, this garden is no more than two and a half years old. We're really fortunate that everything is taking off. We have perfect weather, which is, you know, we had a little bit of a drought, but nor normally speaking, you know, what your weather gives you really affects what you have to do with your soil. If you have really dry climates, you have to really improve your soils all the time and make sure that they're um, extra strong for any type of growth. So this soil prep, digging a bigger space for fruit trees, extends your garden's life or your, your fruit tree's energy into the future, which is really important. Okay, this do I. Yeah, so I like to describe something that occurs in nature that a lot of people don't really understand. And that has to do with the nutrients being available in your soil. And what that energy causes is for plant life to just take over. There is no, if your soil is energetic, healthy, full of nutrients, um, open, meaning it's, it's cultivated enough that seeds can get in there, your garden will absolutely take over and start to grow in such a way that you might not even be able to control it. We've lost a little bit of control here everything is growing too well so I have to come in here these beans have to be harvested and taken out but this idea of having 
let's call it soil ready, your soil is ready to receive seeds, is a very big part of gardening and it's, it's an energy equation. How rich is your soil? How receptive is your soil to, to explosive growth? And all these things that contribute to a garden to be in motion is what every gardener has to try to achieve. They have to try to achieve this forward movement of your garden that the garden is so rich that it, it will accept seeds of any type. And uh, your garden will basically just take over. Uh, the plant material will just take over. And then the gardener's job is to figure out a way how to keep that growth in check, number one. And number two is how this growth, once composted, can give you the same energy back, hopefully the exact same energy. We're really fortunate to have the river that we can add the grainy sandy material, plus the rich compost is a fantastic uh, consistency of, of a soil that will always do well if you're um, on top of it. You have to be on top of this garden. Like all these ditch vines are just growing like crazy. How long are, is this going to be that vigorous? I have to be very cautious that I don't end up with any type of burnout here. I don't want my plants to die out. I don't want them to slow down. So it's going to be a very tricky tricky concept of how do I feed this plant material into the future. Yeah, so I'm going to plant a plant here. I'm going to weed first. And this is all river silt. This came out of the river, this material. A couple of rocks in here from the river still. So I'm gonna make a hole to plant this plant. And as you can see, I have a mixture of really good topsoil that I've composted and the river silt. So you could, you could describe this as the best draining soil you could ever imagine. Anything that likes well-drained soil will do incredibly well in this. My question in this video is, how long will this soil provide um, energy to the plant I'm gonna put in the ground? So that always is the question, is how long will this do well if you're not adding any other material to this? So as you can see, this is very different soil to what I have here. And I, I'm very suspicious that this plant probably doesn't like the soil because it's way too wet. Like that's, and I didn't water this. It's very clay rich and so, and uh, very sticky. It doesn't even come off the plastic bag. So I'm gonna, mix these soils together just so it feels comfortable. Get the weeds out. So the river's right here, and what I'm always going to do is add more river silt to this material. So this area that's close to the river is very self-sufficient because I can always add um, river silt to the process and uh, keep the plants alive. I'm going to actually turn this around. It's more attractive this way. So the question is again, how long can I leave this plant alone without interfering with it? And in gardening, you always have to look at your bottlenecks. And I'll describe my bottleneck here. My bottleneck is I have no source of soil, so I have to either make it, be creative, or figure out a way how to compost in such a way that I get lots of soil. I have lots of life growing, which is a blessing because I can use that life to create green matter, so that's a real advantage. Now this idea of a soil being perpetual is 
ridiculous, but I'm thinking that I could really cheat the system and allow this plant material to do really well for very long. And how do you do that? I think the only weapon there is is constantly, um, how do I describe it, figuring out a way how to get green matter that you have in your soil contributing back to the plant. So this plant is going to give 30% of its energy back to the ground. So as I said before, you only have to worry about that 70% that is missing. And this soil that came from the river mainly is quite charged with nutrients. So I'll get quite a long time out of this. This plant will probably get very big and uh, be very, you know, strong like these guys. So if you can keep your garden moving forward with soil energy, you'll do it incredibly well because the soil energy is the starting point of all this life. Yeah, when you're talking um, soil preparation, we do a, a, a really crazy job on uh, fruit trees. We'll dig a really big hole. We'll make sure that there's no heavy duty rocks below, that the roots can go wherever they need to go. And these fruit trees, they appreciate that. They do incredibly well. This garden is no more than two and a half years old. We're really fortunate that everything is taking off. We have perfect weather, which is, you know, we had a little bit of a drought, but nor normally speaking, you know, what your weather gives you really affects what you have to do with your soil. If you have really dry climates, you have to really improve your soils all the time and make sure that they're um, extra strong for any type of growth. So this soil prep, digging a bigger space for fruit trees, extends your garden's life or your your fruit trees energy into the future which is really important yeah so I like to describe something that occurs in nature that a lot of people don't really understand and that has to do with the nutrients being available in your soil and what that energy causes is for plant life to just take over there is no if your soil is energetic, healthy, full of nutrients, um, open, meaning it's, it's cultivated enough that seeds can get in there, your garden will absolutely take over and start to grow in such a way that you might not even be able to control it. We've lost a little bit of control here. Everything is growing too well. So I have to come in here these beans have to be harvested and taken out. But this idea of having, let's call it soil ready, your soil is ready to receive seeds, is a very big part of gardening and it's, it's an energy equation. How rich is your soil? How receptive is your soil to, to explosive growth? And all these things that contribute to a garden to be in motion is what every gardener has to try to achieve. They have to try to achieve this forward movement of your garden that the garden is so rich that it will accept seeds of any type and uh, your garden will basically just take over, uh, the plant material will just take over and then the gardener's job is to figure out a way how to keep that growth in check, number one, and number two is how this growth, once composted, can give you the same energy back, hopefully the exact same energy. We're really fortunate to have the river that we can add the grainy sandy material, plus the rich compost is a fantastic uh, consistency of, of a soil that will always do well if you're um, on top of it, you have to be on top of this garden. Like all these ditch vines are just growing like crazy. How long are, is this gonna be that vigorous? I have to be very cautious that I don't end up with any type of burnout here. I don't want my plants to die out. I don't want them to slow down. So it's gonna be a very tricky tricky concept of how do I feed this plant material 
into the future. Yeah, so I'm going to do the ultimate soil test. I have some sedum here. Get the weeds out. And what I like to do with these guys, they're so self-sufficient, I'm going to stick it into a corner of a step. And uh, there's a little fern here as well. So what I do is I basically push it in. I'm not too worried about destroying it. Now the reason I'm doing this in this video is I want to talk about... I have more examples here, Laura. I've done this before. Okay. So this other type of sedum is uh, surviving, doing well, it's starting to spread. So what I'm getting at is when you have a plant that is perpetual, that has enough energy inside it to promote itself, to grow, to, to flower, to seed, that is very interesting for me in comparison to the entire garden. This interests me. How does this sedum stay alive not having any extra energy except for maybe water and maybe some silt running down how does this stay alive forever that is um, this perpetual idea of this soil being sufficient for it to grow forever is actually very interesting so I want to transfer that to the whole garden and I'm going to do a couple more examples of how the plants have this ability to create 30% more energy by photosynthesis and giving the energy back into the ground. So if that is true, that plants contribute 30% of the energy of its own um, doing, then that means I only have to worry about 70% as a gardener. That 70% is attainable hopefully within the premises of a garden itself. So this idea of a garden being self-sufficient interests me a lot because it's really hard for me to bring soil in because it's, uh, it's you know, horseback work to bring it in here. So if I can get that soil energy using my own property, that'll help me a lot. Like all these plants are thriving in the little bit of soil that's given inside the crevices of the plant. So a rock garden is probably one of the best examples of self-sufficiency. 